One of the things John said in John chapter 1 was that he was in the Spirit. And that's the only way anybody's going to get this, get the truth out of this, get these messages, is in the Spirit. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And that's when he heard the voice of God. If we're really going to hear from God, we're going to have to be in the Spirit. And we sure do need Him. We cannot know what He's talking about without God's help. When it comes to Revelation uh, 2 and 3, it reminds me, it's my testimony, so I always give it when we get to this point. Sometime in the early 90s, I guess it was, Brother Earl and Betty were visiting us in Lexington. And uh, the Spirit just drove me to my office to get away from everybody, visitors and family and everybody, and just read the Bible. So I did. I went in there and got my Bible out, and I thought, where am I going to read? And I thought, well, I hadn't read Revelation in a long time. I think I'll read there. So I got the book of Revelation out. I thought, where in Revelation am I going to read? So I started in chapter 2. Now, um, the first verse of chapter 2 says what? And verse 2? Yeah, let me ask you a question now. You don't have to have any kind of... You don't have to go to graduate school to answer this. The word you, is that one person or a bunch of people? In English, you can't tell. So when you're reading Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, you don't know. You could be a billion people. You people of earth could be a little baby, just one. Could be six people, two people. That's one of the big drawbacks of the English language, the word you. You don't know what it means. When I read that, the Lord spoke to me and said, that I had always heard, as you had always heard, that these were the seven messages to the seven churches of Asia. Never had even questioned it. And the Spirit said to me, uh, that is to one person. And I stopped. And then I looked at verse 1. To the messenger. It's to one person. The messenger of the saints. The assembly in Ephesus, or the congregation in Ephesus, is the pastor, the teacher. That's who this is to. Now, at first I thought, well, I know that's the Lord talking to me. I know that's right, but the Bible says try the spirits to see if they are of God. Now, how, I know how to try that spirit. I'll go get my Greek Bible out and read it in Greek and see, because the Greek you for one person is a different breed of animal from you for two or more people. You see, this is the, this is the uh, for one person, that's what it looks like. That's, what it, just you, that's, that's one person, if you're going to say you in Greek. But if you're going to say, you're going to say you for two people, look at the difference. You can't even mix them up. You can't even get them accidentally mixed up. So I knew I'd be able to tell. And when I, and when I got out my Greek Bible to see if I was really hearing from the Lord, this was the one that was there. Now, to make that distinction in the English, I decided that every time you met more than one person, I would make, I'd make that letter right there, Y. I'd make that in italics. So anywhere in my translation of the New Testament that you see the word you and it has the Y is the only thing that's in italics, is referring to more than one person. I figured that is a way to make English make sense. So these yous here are all one person because he's talking to one person. He's just talking to this messenger of the congregation in Ephesus. And this is what he says. Now, let me, let me, that's not the end of my testimony. Let me finish my testimony. Seven, probably 17 years before I graduated from the seminary. One of my favorite subjects was studying Greek. I had three years of it. Very good instructors. 
And at the end of one of the second or third year, I can't remember which one, the assignment was to take one of the books of the New Testament, it had to be a larger one, he gave us a group of the bigger ones, had to take one of the books of the New Testament and learn it in Greek. Greek English had nothing to do with it. You had to learn every verb, every form, every noun, every particle. And the final exam would be to go up in his office one-on-one -on -one with nothing but him, him holding a Greek Bible and me holding a Greek Bible and him telling me to translate. And I chose Revelation. That was the book I chose. And so the day came when, uh, and by the time I walked in his office, I knew everything about Greek grammar in that Reve in the book of Revelation. Any word, any part of a word, any piece of a word, I knew it all from verse one to the last verse. Every place he took me, uh, what, where'd that verb come from? What's the original form? What's the, what's the root of that verb? What's this now? What's that? I knew it all, every single word. He got so frustrated because I got everything right that he took me into Mark and some difficult passage there, I said, now translate that. And I did. He said, well, that's getting at it. I said, get <laughs> But I say that to show you something. Because just to let you know how well I knew the book of Revelation in Greek, and yet I hadn't seen this at all. It takes the spirit to show you the truth. Amen. No matter whether you know Greek, there are people that spoke Greek to kill Jesus. Amen. I'm glad I learned it. But Jesus said, I'm going to send you back the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost is going to guide you into all truth. All truth. If you're going to learn truth from God, it's going to be through the Spirit. There's nothing else that's going to teach you, including the Bible. Because you can't read the Bible and understand it without the Spirit helping you. I need God to help me understand the Bible. It doesn't matter whether I can read Greek or not. If I read it in whatever language, Spanish, Italian, we need the Holy Ghost to show us what it's talking about. It just doesn't matter. But that story, I like telling that story because it really shows how much we depend on Jesus. We don't know anything about God unless it comes from Jesus through the Spirit the way it came to John through the Spirit. It's the only way you can learn anything. And you cannot know any Greek whatsoever or Hebrew or anything else and know God very well if you're led by the Spirit because that is the truth. That's the truth about God, letting you know how He feels about things, how he, what He thinks about people. So if you're filled with the Spirit of God, you've got the knowledge you need. John said, you know all things. He was talking to people filled with the Spirit. You know everything you need to know if you know what God wants you to do. To the messenger of the congregation in Ephesus write. This is to the pastor of the congregation in Ephesus. He who holds the seven stars in his right hand that's that vision John just had in chapter 1. Who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands says these things. I know your works and labor and your patience and that you cannot stomach evildoers. And you have put to the test those who call themselves apostles but are not. And you have found them liars. You have patience, and you have endured for my name, and you have not grown weary. Now, isn't that wonderful? Look, how many people, you ask yourself, how many people have the knowledge, have, have the knowledge of God to be able to put to the test men who claim to be sent from God but are not, and prove that they're liars? He's in a tough spot. But he's able to do the warfare of the Spirit to protect the congregation from such men. And he's had patience. He's endured through who knows what. He's had to deal with false apostles, false teachers, and he's protected the saints of God from them. He's, he has worked. He's hated evil the way God hates it. 
He's done a lot of good things. But, nevertheless, I have something against you because you have forsaken your first love. Remember then from where you have fallen and repent and do your first works. Otherwise, I will come upon you and will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Then he adds one thing to encourage him a little bit. But you do have this. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You got that going for you. Now, what did he mean when he said, I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent? Here's a man that is really, really a servant of God. He's not faking. He hadn't been elected by a board of deacons. He's been anointed by God to be where he is. He's not a Christian. He's a servant of Jesus. Really a servant of Jesus. Jesus knows him. And he's done all these wonderful things for people to protect the saints. He hates what God hates. He hates evil doing. He hates evil doer, the doers that are trying to undermine the faith of the saints. He's had patience. He's, in, he's been through some hard times. And yet, the Lord is telling him that he's committed a crime that's so great that he's about to take his lampstand away from him. Now where, or remove the lampstand from its place, which is in Ephesus, what is the lampstand? Remember the last verse of, the cha of chapter 1? Jesus told him what the lampstand was. He told us all. The lampstands are the congregations. King James says, it calls it a candlestick. It's a, lamp, it's a lampstand for candles. He's telling him he's, he will no longer allow him to be pastor. Either he'll remove the congregation to another place or remove him. Remove them from being under his shadow. Now, if somebody has worked for the Lord that way and has suffered you know, to, uh, due to warfare for the saints that way, and is put up with so much, and Jesus compliments him and encourages him and tells him what a wonderful thing he's done here and there, and he feels the way God feels about certain people and certain doctrines. It had to be a pretty major crime for him to tell him, you're about to lose your congregation. I'm going to change things if you don't repent. So, the crime of le losing your first love is a big one. He had lost his first love. Now, what is your first love? Well, we know generally what it is. Just the love you have when you first come to the Lord. The love that uh, you have of the people of God. There are three things in 1 John that he says you must do, that everybody who does receives the Holy Ghost, is born again. One of them is believe in Jesus. One of them is to do righteousness, do works that are meet for repentance, as John the Baptist said. And the third one is to love the family of God. Anybody who does those three things is going to receive the Holy Ghost. You can't run fast enough to get away from it. It's going to fall on you, wherever you are. Usually when you first come into the family of God, when you're born again, if you're normal, you think everybody's better than you are. Yeah. Amen. The real warfare of your life is going to be to keep thinking that. When Paul wrote at least uh, to one congregation and said, Esteem one another better than yourself. He was saying the same thing. Don't lose your first love. The challenge comes about because as you begin to drink the milk of the Word of God, the way Peter said, so that you could grow to salvation by doing that, you become a smarter in the Lord. You're able to see things a little clearer, things that you used to think were good. You're starting to see it. The way God sees us, maybe that's not so good. Things that you thought were maybe a little bit, I don't know, and you find out that's the way God is. 
your discernment increases. With that comes the ability to start discerning some things about God's people that might not be so hot. Are you going to be able to keep your first love and esteem them better than you, even if you grow to where you can see a fault? That's the challenge. I discovered, it, I didn't do it, I didn't uh, decide it, I didn't will it, I discovered somewhere along the way, and I think it's because of the wonderful help I had growing up in the Lord, I discovered somewhere along my pathway that when a brother or a sister did wrong, I didn't change. My feelings toward them, my thoughts for them didn't change. And it surprised me that it didn't change because all my life in the world, somebody did something I didn't like. I felt a certain way. But when I grew in the Lord, I found out you could do whatever you wanted to do. My feelings are not going to change. I discovered that. It was a wonderful thing to look down and say, well, hey, what, what happened? <laughs> but that's how the Spirit does. That's how the Spirit feels. If we can, Jesus said, if you only love the people who are like you, <laughs> not much worth to you. It was a wonderful discovery to find out that the first love was still there no matter how you behave. That's what this uh, pastor had lost. He'd done the warfare with those false apostles. Let me remind you of something. You cannot be a false apostle until after you've been a true one. You remember? In the Old Testament, there's no such thing as a false prophet in Israel who's not a child of God. The rest is just crazy worldly stuff. False religion altogether. But to be what the Bible calls a false apostle, you have to belong to God to start with. And then go off the track. So he had been dealing... Uh, this, this pastor here at, at Ephesus had been dealing with brothers, elders, that God's people looked up to who had begun to teach some things that were wrong. They still looked good. That's what made them a danger to God's people. They looked good. But they weren't good. They'd gone astray after money, Paul said, some of them. Pursuing money, pursuing title, prestige, it's all out there now. But it, they were brothers. And he apparently had begun to feel toward them ways that Jesus doesn't feel. Jesus said, as much as you do it to the least of these my brethren, you do it to me. And then he told us that the least among the brothers are the men who break God's commandments and teach others to do it. To do just like that. So the ones... God's people, God, ministers who are disobeying God and teaching that disobedience to others, if they have the Holy Ghost, they're the very least in the kingdom of God and you don't love God one bit more than you love them. How you feel toward them is really how you feel toward God because He's their Father. And Jesus said, how you treat them is how you treat me. We don't get any credit for loving one another. How can you... How can you keep from loving me? <laughs> How can I keep from loving you? How can you keep from loving one another? Comes with the program. It's your attitude toward God's people who are doing wrong that shows where you really are in God. And that's the lesson he had to learn. And Jesus said if he didn't learn it, he couldn't stay in his place. The congregation would be removed. After all, now you, can, you think about this. You work up a bad attitude toward what Jesus himself called a false apostle. The pastor probably called him that and some other things, but Jesus called them false apostles. You work up a bad attitude toward him for teaching false things to God's people. What are you going to do if he repents? What if he repents and comes to the congregation and asks them to forgive him and they forgive him and you won't? He may take your place. So it's a very dangerous thing to have a wall of 
bad attitude or hatred towards somebody because they're teaching false doctrine. You gotta repent for that. Jesus can't even use you to help them if the door is open. That's why it made it so dangerous for him to lose his first love because he couldn't do those any good who were wrong. And Jesus loves those who are wrong. He specializes in wrong people who do wrong things. Amen. Christ died for the ungodly. He said, the sick, Jesus said, the sick don't need a physician. I'm here for the sick people. Glory to God. And he's still like that. And that's why we have to keep the right attitude and keep that first love. And when we first come in, we think everybody knows more, everybody's better, everybody's worth more. You just, your, your heart is open to everybody's testimony. Stay that way. Stay that way. Even when you grow up and you see some things, pray for them. If God gives you discernment to see a fault in a brother, it's not for you to talk about or have a bad attitude about. God, help them. And it's tough. One of the hardest things you'll ever experience in this life is to outgrow somebody who brought you to the Lord. It ought not to ever happen, but it does. And it's very painful. At first, it's extremely confusing when you have to admit to yourself that that person is just not where in the Lord you always thought. But no matter what, you have to keep that first love. And that's where the Spirit comes in because you can't do it. If somebody's fooled you and they, you, know, you thought they were somewhere you weren't and all that, in your flesh you have a bad attitude. But the Spirit of God gives you the good attitude. So that you can see people where they really, see them the way God sees them. Not fooled, not fooled by reputation, appearance, title, anything. He's not fooled at all. He just sees it the way it is and there's nobody who loves us the way he does. Seeing everything. He wants us like him. Where he can trust you with information about me. That's what he wants. If he can do that, one of the greatest compliments Paul ever paid to a group of believers was to the Romans, the, the saints in Rome. And it's just a short little phrase, and he just goes on to something else. He doesn't dwell on it. But I think it's as high a compliment as you could ever want. He said, you also are able, you saints in Rome are able, to reprove one another or admonish one another. That means that you have the wisdom over here to help admonish or warn a brother or sister over here and this brother or sister over here has the humility to receive it and wisdom that they might be able to admonish you later on about something and you have the humility. They had wisdom, knowledge, discernment and they kept their first love with one another. That's life. That's really where we want to be. If we lose it, we're worthless. We're another group of Pharisees who only love those who are like us. And that's no good at all. So that's the situation with the first pastor. Now, if you think, as I always thought when I read that before the Lord showed me that it was to one person, if you think that this message is to a group of people, it changes everything. When you narrow it down to one human being who's in a position of being a messenger to the congregation, it makes what Jesus really meant come alive. That's what it did for me. In verse 7, he concluded his first message to that pastor by saying, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the assembly. To him who overcomes, will I give to eat of the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. What a promise. Don't you want to see that glassy sea and transparent, glittering like crystal and see those four living blobs with, or whatever, things with the eyes and the wings. And, the, and I want to see the fire that's alive. Those seven flames that are flaming. Can you imagine? Think about so looking at a bonfire and there's this huge bla blazing up thing and it's alive and it talks. 
And in chapter 1, it says, hello. <laughs> I mean, that's just, I want to see that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the four, 24 elders and, oh my. And, and the, the hallelujah meeting they had in chapters 4 and 5 when God gave Jesus the revelation, I imagine it's going to be surpassed the day we get home. Mm-hmm. When Jesus carries his... They're rulers. When, when, the, when we stand on that glassy sea and sing the song of Moses and the Lamb that he'll teach us that day through the Spirit, and the angels have to watch and listen. Oh, my. We're, they're going to be watching a group of people who are going to rule over them. It's the new rulers who have showed up. That's going to be a meeting. And they're going to watch us praise our Father and marvel. Don't you want to be there? Who would not want to be there standing on that sea that's transparent? It makes you wonder, what you, if it's transparent, what's below it? <laughs> I don't know, but it's transparent. You're just standing like in midair, just before the Father and all those creatures there. Wow. To be there is life. What a day that's going to be. Verse 8. And to the messenger of the congregation in Smyrna write. Oh, by the way, let me show you, show you very briefly. Here's where Canaan is. Here's where the Isle of Patmos is, where John was exiled. I told you that. All of these uh, cities are in this area right here. So... John is on the Isle of Patmos, and Jesus says, send these, send these messengers to the seven congregations. There are seven of them right in here. That's where they all are. Is he on that little island there? The island he's, he is on is so small, it's not even on here. It's just in this general area. So that's where he is. That's where Smyrna is, and Ephesus, and the rest of them. Well, is Patmos an isle of Rome? Is that where Rome? Was Rome, the Rome owned it all. So that was where Rome sent people into exile. I would imagine so. Great. Yeah. John, these are seven congregations in the hall. Well, you see, what, uh, yeah, Paul went to all these places. There was also a congregation called, at Colossae, Book of Colossians. They're right in the smack, they're right in this area too, but they're not mentioned. It's also Laodicea. Well, it is mentioned, Laodicea is. But Paul went out of Antioch and went down this way first and came and then later made another trip and started a lot of these congregations. But when Paul got old, when he got to be an old man, he wrote Timothy and he said, you know, Timothy, all of them in Asia, which is that territory, Roman province of Asia, all of them have forsaken the truth. All of them had been persuaded to add ceremonies to, to the Spirit. All of them. That's pretty tough on Paul as an old man to see his whole work come to nothing. The last time, his third trip, third recorded trip, the last time Paul made a, a journey, he was going back to Jerusalem from over in this area, and he stopped, his ship stopped somewhere close to Ephesus, and he sent for the congregation elders to come down to the shore to meet him. It's in Acts chapter 20. And they came down there, and Paul talked with the elders at Ephesus. He said, now, you know, I warned you day and night when I lived among you, and I did this and did that. The Holy Ghost has made you overseers of the flock of God. He says that. And right before he left, he said, now, I know that after I'm gone, some of you are going to be like a wolf with the flock to make disciples after your own selves. You're going to enter in, you're not going to spare the flock. Can you imagine looking at the eyes of some of these people that Jesus might have been talking about as false apostles and saying, I know you're going to do it. Same way Moses did right before he died with Israel. I know what you're going to do. Don't do it. But I know you're going to do it. Now they, all of them hugged Paul and cried 
because he told them, you're never going to see me again. And that made them very sad. But some of the people who hugged his neck and cried that day became a false apostle. Now, Paul knew the truth. He knew that all these congregations in chapter 2 and 3 and others as well, probably Colossae, so far gone, Jesus didn't even have a messenger there. When he said they all had forsaken me, he meant the truth, his doctrine, what he was teaching them, what he had brought them in, into the Lord believing. So when, when Jesus sends this message, he's not talking to the false apostles. He's not talking to the vast majority who've gone into other doctrines. He may have been talking to six people in somebody's basement, but they were really gods. He's talking to a remnant, not to, what Paul, not to all that Paul knew while he was alive and traveling, but what was left over after they'd all forsaken him. That's what makes it really interesting. The book of Timothy took both of them, are written from Paul wherever he was in the world at that time to Timothy at Ephesus. Timothy was the messenger at Ephesus for a pretty good long time. I'm not saying he was the man here. He could have been, but if he did, he, you know, he'd gotten on some age by then. And it's very touching. If you read the books of Timothy very carefully, Paul is telling Timothy no. No to what? Well, he's wanting to leave Ephesus and, and stay with Paul. And Paul is saying, endure hardship like a good soldier. And he says to Timothy at one, in one of his letters, he said, now I sent you there to rebuke some that they teach no other doctrine. And he mentions by name three or four, five people in both books who are beginning to teach some strange doctrines and tell us what they are. So Timothy's right there trying to salvage what he could among God's people. He was just a young man, but he was the best Paul had. Paul said, don't let anybody despise your youth. You rebuke with all authority. You know what's right. And be an example of purity and faith. Don't let anybody despise your youth. Well, apparently he salvaged enough for Jesus to send a message to a messenger that was there. There were some people who were still holding on to the truth. But I, I, I might as well say I know this was not the majority because the majority had fallen away. And like I say, it might have been just six people. Somebody's back room. But little as much if God is in it. Yes. Amen. Amen. Jesus said where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm right there in the midst of it. He's standing in the midst of the lamps in the first chapter. That's where John saw him standing in the midst of the candlesticks. That means if we really are God's people and He approves of us getting together here, Jesus is here. Yeah. And we want Jesus here. We want Jesus here. We want this to be really something of Him. There's no point in getting together if it's not. I don't care about it. God, be with us. God, be with us and let us be yours. And let this be your place and your people, God. Let this be what you approve of and what you will be with, God, and save and rescue and help. Strengthen and hold us up, O oh God. Let us be faithful in all things. Amen. So that's the history and the situation around Ephesus. We know more about Ephesus than any of these other congregations because this mention has a book written to it, the book of Ephesians, and has stories in the book of Acts about what happened there with Paul. And we don't have uh, anything on that scale with the rest of these. In verse 8, To the messenger of the congregation in Smyrna write, The first and the last, who was dead and came to life, says these things. I know your suffering and poverty. Oh, but you are rich. Boy, I tell you, Jesus tells you you are rich. You are rich. 
But he's a very poor man. Very poor man with money. And I know the blasphemy of those who claim to be Jews and are not. Paul sent one letter to us Gentile believers and he called us the Israel of God. That's who Jesus is talking about. He's talking about the Jews of God. And to understand that, you have to understand what Paul taught. In Romans chapter 2, the last two verses, let's see who is really a Jew. For he is not a Jew. Yeah, verse 28. Look at what Paul says. If, he, if Paul went to Jerusalem during his lifetime and said this, he'd have been killed on the spot. He risked his life to teach this doctrine that God had taught him. And this is it. He is not a Jew that is one on the outside. In other words, a physical circumcision does not make you a Jew in God's sight. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. Isn't that what he says? In other words, in God's sight, Paul is speaking from Christ. He's trying to get across the fact that if you circumcise a baby at eight days old the way Moses commanded, it doesn't mean anything to God anymore. Circumcision now, he says in the next verse, is in the heart by the Spirit and not in the flesh. Isn't that what he says? Yes. You're a Jew if you're one on the inside where Jesus circumcises your heart. It's the only kind of circumcision that counts with God. Let me show you something. I've, I've told you before. Look at Philippians chapter 3. I'll show you where I'm getting this from. Read chapter 3. Starting in chapter 3, I think it is, Stuart. I mean, it's very interesting. Paul says, finally, my brother, and then he writes the second half of the book. You just ignore that word. Yeah. Finally, my brother, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you is safe. Yeah, so I, in other words, I, you've heard this before, but it's not going to hurt you to hear it again. It's, it's safe for you to hear it again. So let's see what he has already told them some. Beware of dogs. Now that dogs are uh, immoral men, effeminate men. Beware of evil workers. Beware of conclusion. Beware of the concision. That's a play on a word, circumcision. The word circumcision means, means physical Jew. Here is circumcision, more or less. Circumcision. He says, he doesn't call it that. He calls it the concision. And it's a very good reflection of where those two words come from. You ever heard the word perimeter? Peri? This means around. Peri. And this is cut, more or less. I'm just making up something here. Cut around. That's a circumcision. Okay? Paul doesn't even want to call it circumcision because it's not circumcision in God's sight anymore to do, to do that to a human being on, in the flesh. So instead of calling it peritome, he calls it katatome. Doesn't kata sound rough? <laughs> it's mutilation. It's a rough cut. It's just, instead of circumcision, in other words, it's beware the Jewish teachers who are coming to you telling you you've got to have a physical circumcision. Beware the mutilators who want to come mutilate your body and glory in it. So he's teaching that circumcision now is done only by Jesus. And he does it in your heart through the Holy Ghost. And he's saying that is on, that's the only thing that counts with God. He is not saying, he's not calling the physical Jews people of God anymore. This is why he would have been killed and almost was killed in Jerusalem for teaching it. 
With that goes all the truth about ceremonies. Baptism is just a worthless, watery dunking in the flesh. God doesn't see a human being on earth as baptized unless Jesus has done it. Amen. He's got all His love in His Son. And Jesus doesn't baptize people with water. There's no water up in heaven for Him to pour down on you. He baptizes with what He's got. <laughs> he said, it says in Hebrews, He's a minister of the heavenly tabernacle. So He ministers heavenly substance. So He feeds you with something that goes down inside. Your heart, not to your stomach. His feast days, His communion is spiritual. His baptism is spiritual. His circumcision is spiritual. That was Paul's doctrine. So when Jesus is saying here to the pastor at, at Smyrna, I know the blasphemy of those who claim to be Jews, but they're not. He's saying that they claim to be people of God, but He hasn't circumcised them. So they're not. They're still uncircumcised of heart. And that's how He wants us to understand all this New Testament. In spirit and in truth instead of in the flesh. Amen. John there in uh, 9 when he's saying, but are the synagogue of Satan, is he exposing the Antichrist then? Yeah. The uh, ones that have gone astray and not, not teaching right? Yes, a synagogue is a gathering place, a meeting place. And when people who claim to be long to God, but don't, gather to worship. And that's all they gather. They gather to worship. Who's being worshipped? Not God, because he, he must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. So God's not being worshipped, but somebody's being worshipped. Jesus, Paul, David, Moses, and others said that whoever worshipped outside the law, the idols of the heathen, were worshipping demons. That's pretty rough. It's pretty harsh, but it's sound doctrine. God, through Jesus, didn't give us one of hundreds of options. He made the way to eternal life. And it's the only way. Amen. That's what makes Jesus so precious. If there are other ways, Jesus is just one, you know, He's okay. But He's not precious. His doctrine is precious. His spirit is precious. His body is precious. It's not but one of any of it. And Jesus taught, I mean, this pretty rough language when he called it blasphemy to claim to belong to God when you don't. But don't we want him to be plain with us? Because if he beats around the bush, we won't get it. He called it blasphemy because he loved these people. He wanted them to know how bad it was to think there was another way other than go by the Spirit. That's the only way any, anything gets made right. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. Let me show you how, how Peter referred to these false teachings. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. What does that say, Paul? But there were false prophets also among the people. Who are the people? The children. That's, that's Israel. They were the people as opposed to the Gentiles. And you know from your study of the Old Testament, there were false prophets among the people. So he's saying, just as there were false prophets among the people in the first covenant, so what? So also among the people, even if there shall be false teachers among them. Among you. There were false prophets in the old covenant, and there are going to be false teachers in the new. But look at what he says in verse 2. Who privately, not privately, or privately, sneakily, shall bring into damnable heresy. Yeah, now that's what I wanted to read. He does not say that they just bring in other ideas. He doesn't say, well, they're just mistaken. He doesn't say, well, maybe we need to consider all views. He says they're damnable heresies. Anything but the truth that was given from heaven is a damnable heresy because if you take it in and live by it, instead of the truth, you're going to be damned. If you believe a lie, you'll be damned. That's what makes the truth precious because it's the only thing that's going to save you. 
Jesus called it blasphemy. Peter called it damnable heresies. Anything but the truth that the Spirit of God teaches you is destructive. It will ruin your soul. We want to have that attitude. Otherwise, you'll never love the truth the way you ought to. Never. The truth is not just one option among many. Everything that's optional is a lie. If it's really of God, if Jesus died for it, you've got to have it. Amen. Starting with the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's where it all starts because that guides you into all truth. If Jesus condescended from the place where you saw Him Saturday night up in heaven, all that glory, if He has con have you ever been in an airplane and looked down? You can't even see people, they're so small. If He's condescended from that glory to your house, into your heart to show you His truth, don't you dare tell somebody that's just what you think. That's a lie. It's a coward's way out. If Jesus has shown you the truth, confess it. It's not your opinion. It didn't come from... You're not that smart. You're not that smart just to think that. You never thought in your life till Jesus gave it to you. That's confessing Christ. Right. It's not confessing Christ to say, well, you know, what I think is, that's not confessing Christ. Confessing Christ is, Jesus taught me this. Yeah, that's right, that's right. This is the truth. And I love it. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. That's one way of confessing Christ. It's confess what He's done for you, what He's shown you, what He's taught you, what you have from heaven. That's your life. Well, I, I love what Jesus said when they were accusing him of being a liar and, and deceiver and a false prophet. They accused him of being demon-possessed. And he said, I am not demon-possessed. I am honoring my Father and you dishonor me. And if I said I didn't know the truth, I'd be a liar like you. Mm -hmm. He had to confess what his Father taught him because he loved his Father. He knew they were confused. He was, he was not confused. He knew they were. So... Don't be confused as to whether you're confused or not. <laughs> you used to be confused. You're not confused now. That's right. Don't act like it. To the messenger of the congregation in Smyrna write, The first and the last who was dead and came to life says these things, I know your suffering and poverty, but you are rich and the blasphemy of those who claim to be Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. In verse 10, Do not fear the things you are about to suffer. Two of these seven pastors are not rebuked by Jesus and told to repent. This is one of them. Jesus is satisfied with him 100%. He may not have the knowledge that the pastor at Ephesus had, may not have some of the other things some other pastors had, but Jesus was 100% satisfied with him. And that's the difference between the true God and the God of Christianity. Jesus can be 100% satisfied with you. And it's not hard. You don't have to measure up to anybody else's measure. You can make Jesus perfectly happy. This guy did. But look at the love he had. Look how Jesus dealt with him. Do not fear the things you are about to suffer. Does that you have a italics on the why? No. It's just talking to this man. But look at what he is about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you He's telling this pastor some of the people there are about to die because of this truth, because of the love of God. You're about to suffer by having to deal with this. Some of you are going to be killed, arrested. Your property confiscated. That's what they did. He was telling him don't be afraid because he knew this man wasn't real strong and he had a great love of these people. He's telling him you're going to have to watch some things now. The devil is about to cast some of you into prison to be tested, and plural you, some of you folks there, you're going to have tribulation, the whole group of you, going to have tribulation for ten days. 
Be faithful unto death. Some of you are going to have to. And I will give you a crown of life. Don't let it shake you. Don't let it move you. It's going to happen. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the assemblies. He who overcomes will not be harmed by the second death. To the messenger of the congregation in Pergamon, write, He who holds the sharp double-edged sword says these things. I know where you are living. Second part of verse 12. He who has the sharp double-edged sword says these things. You know why I changed that? The word is to have, but it's used hold if you're talking about a sword. That's why I put hold there, but that's wrong. You know why? It just came to mind why. Because John saw the sword coming out of his mouth. He wasn't holding it. So it ought to be he who has the sharp double-edged sword says these things. I know where you are living. Now think about this. It is where the throne of Satan is. Why? Why? I have looked and looked and looked and researched and researched and I can't find anything about Pergamon that wasn't somewhat like other places. They did have a gigantic altar there larger than this room, huge steps, wide steps as wide as this room going up into it, up where the sacrifices were made, life-size carvings around it of the titans wrestling with the other gods where Zeus was worshipped up there on that altar. The altar of Zeus in Pergamon, you know, Zeus was the chief of the gods. And that is Satan, we know that. But there were other altars of Zeus all around the Mediterranean, Pergamon had a medical school there. They had a huge library, second to none, except for Alexandria, Virginia. I mean, Virginia. <laughs> Alexandria, Egypt. <laughs> I don't know why Jesus calls Pergamon where Satan's throne is. There's something about Pergamon. Every chance I get, anything I can read about Pergamon, I do it. See if I can find out why Jesus said this. They had some idols of Athena and other stuff and other elements of that huge altar, gigantic altar, just tiny parts of it, relatively speaking, some lifetime statues sent to San Francisco, and I went to see it, the Pergamon exhi exhibit there, when it was in the uh, what was it, Hall of Honor or Legion of Honor there. He didn't learn anything that would solve the riddle, solve the mystery is why Pergamon is where the throne of Satan is. So if you see anything about Pergamon, send it on to me. Let's see if we can't find out something. The, that mystery hadn't been revealed yet. By the way, that gigantic altar was dismantled by German archaeologists over a hundred years ago and shipped to Berlin and put back together and it's in a museum there now in the Archaeological History Museum, along with a bunch of other stuff from the Middle East. That'd be a fascinating place to go. But the actual altar is there. The biggest parts of it, anyway. So we know that Pergamon is where Satan's throne is, whatever that means. If it's not Zeus's altar, I, don't, I, can't, I can't imagine. I don't have the information. And yet you hold fast to my name. You did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my martyr, my faithful one who was slain among you where Satan dwells. And that you, he's talking about a group. Got italics there. Nevertheless, I know you've been faithful. You've been through some hard times. But I have a few things against you because you have there some holding to the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to lay a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat food offered to idols and to commit fornication. So that must have been a big deal there. I have heard, I don't know this is true, but I've heard that all the meat that was sold in the city of Pergamon first had to be sanctified at that huge altar, dedicated to Zeus. And that being so, 
it would have been incumbent on God's little group here not to eat that meat because it had been dedicated to Zeus and everybody knew it and expected you to go along with it, eat meat offered to idols. And Jesus doesn't want that to happen. Paul said, if you were invited to a feast and you feel like going, go. And if they offer you meat, don't even ask them if it's been offered to an idol. Just eat it if you're hungry. But if they come to you saying, this is in honor of Zeus, then don't eat it for their conscience sake so that you can be an example to them. But if they don't say anything, go ahead and enjoy yourself. <laughs> That's what he said when he wrote to the Corinthians. We, he said, we know the idol's nothing and all that's just nothing, but if they come bragging about their God, don't, don't eat it for their sake. So this is obviously a place where Jesus wants his people to be an example by not eating meat offered to idols. Now, if they hadn't made a big deal out of it and nobody paid any attention to you eating it and nobody thought you were honoring Zeus, it would be fine to eat it because the idol's nothing. It's worthless, empty. But it must have been a status thing or something there. Anyway, there were those here in Pergamon who held to that doctrine of Balaam to intermingle. We ought to examine all views. We ought not to be judgmental. You don't think you're the only one who's right, do you? i tell you what I think. I think God is the only one right. That's who I'm sticking with. To eat food offered to idols and to commit fornication. What is fornication? Spiritual fornication. That's when you start partaking of the religion and the ways of those idols. It's when you start intermarrying with people who say they are Jews and are not being unfaithful to Jesus. Likewise, you have there also some who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and there's not a person on the planet Earth who knows what that doctrine is. So you can forget the commentaries that go into it. Nobody knows. In his first message to the pastor at Ephesus, in verse 6, he said, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. So Jesus was congratulating him. He's not congratulating this pastor. He does not hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. There was too much pressure at Pergamon to be all-inclusive for everybody to get along, to have respect for one another's religions and views and traditions, some of them a thousand years old or more. Surely it's respectable by now. That's the pressure there with their library and their learning and their medical school and their gigantic altar. It was a little here from Egypt and a little here. Let's worship Isis and let's worship the mother goddess of Syria and let's worship. It's okay. Let's all get together. It didn't work. People love it. God hates it because he doesn't have anything to do with it. And Isaiah, he said... Uh, where are all these gods down there y'all talking about? He said, I've looked around here. I had not seen any. He says that in Isaiah. I, I don't see any. And to worship those things provokes him because he knows it's going to destroy your soul. He doesn't want that. Verse 16, he tells this pastor, Repent. Otherwise I will soon come upon you and I will wage war against who? Them. In other words, if you don't do it, I am. Get it straight. I will soon come upon you and I will wage war against them with the sword of my mouth. So this pastor has let things go on to where it's pretty bad, but it's not too late for him to do something. We're going to see something here in a minute. Situation just like this, but it's gone on too long and the, the pastor can't do anything about it. He's let things go on too long. But one thing I want to point out here. You know, if you notice... Jesus, especially in, in, coming up, Jesus is holding these pastors of his personally accountable for how others are behaving. He's responsible for there to be a healthy environment for people to be born again. It's bad to let men come in with a show of humility 
and teach perverse things. I can't let that happen because I'll be held accountable. It's not safe for you. It's not good for people who want to come in and get right with God. You've got to have a place where there's love and there's truth and there's peace and there's government and there's joy. Good food to grow up on and not confusion and division and strife and envy. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the congregations. To him who overcomes will I give some of the hidden manna. And that's spiritual food. And I will give him a white stone. That's in the resurrection. And upon the stone a new name is written which no one knows except the one who receives it. <laughs> in other words, God's got a nickname for you. Nobody else can call you that. You're the only person that's going to know what your nickname is. Isn't that great? Huh? Everybody get one. God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are as fine brass says these things. I know your works and love and faith and service and your patience. Isn't that good? And your last works are greater than the first. But I have something against you because you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess but who is teaching and leading my slaves astray to commit fornication and to eat food offered to idols. You put up with that. He's holding this against him. She's another subject that's coming up in a minute. He's saying, I'm holding this against you. You allow this to go on there. And I gave her time to repent but she has no desire to turn from her fornication. How about that? So, Jesus is very merciful. She was teaching his servants, his slaves, to commit fornication. That's pretty much the doctrine of Balaam. Eat meat offered to idols and commit fornication. And he still gave her time to repent. On the day of judgment when God damns all the souls that he will damn for eternity there won't be one person able to say, you didn't do enough to try to help me. You didn't give me enough time. Not one person. God is good. I gave her time to repent, and now the time is up. That's an important lesson. God is very merciful. His mercy is above the clouds, the Bible says, but He's nobody's fool. He's not a sucker. There is a time limit. Now watch. I am casting her onto a bed and those who commit adultery with her into great affliction unless they turn from her ways. And her children will I kill with a deadly disease. In other words, it's gone past to where the pastor can do anything. The last pastor, he said, now you fix it. Or if you don't, I'm coming. He didn't even ask this pastor to do anything. It's too late. She's already infected the body and it's got a cancer in it and Jesus is coming to cut it out. You know how Jesus cuts out parts of the body? With an idea. They get an idea. And that idea takes them away. He didn't come physically cut you. He just sends a lying spirit, Paul said. The wrong idea about God and it takes your heart and suddenly you think you know more than you, you've moved on. You, you understand you're deeper and you just have to go. You, you can't stay here anymore. You don't fit in. don't belong. That's how Jesus operates on his body. Paul called it a strong delusion. A strong delusion is just a revelation from God using a lying spirit to get rid of you. That's all it is. It's a revelation where you think you've gone deeper. You may even pray hard for the rest of the people you leave behind that sometime, hopefully they'll see what you see now. I've seen it happen. I know it happens. And all the assemblies shall know that I am the examiner of hearts and minds, and I will give to each of you according to your what? 
how you behave, how you live your life is going to determine where you end up. And then he doesn't speak to the pastor. He speaks to the congregation. This is the message that comes closest to being to the group instead of the man because now he talks to the whole group. Now to the rest in Thyatira I say as many as do not have that doctrine and who have not known, as they say, the depths of Satan, I put no other burden on you, only hold fast what you do have until I come. And you know what that's telling you? That's telling you that even if I don't do my job, you can live right. That pastor wasn't doing his job. But Jesus said they're worthy to walk with me. Just hold on to what you've got. So even a bad pastor is no excuse for sin. To him who overcomes and maintains my ways until the end will I give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with an iron staff. The way potter's vessels are shattered. Boy, that's some kind of rule, isn't it? That's how Jesus is going to reign on the earth for a thousand years. With a shattering, of a smashing of jars. and That's how he's going to afflict the earth for disobedience for a thousand years. And you're going to be there with him. He's going to be doing that through his people. To reign with Christ means to follow his orders, carry out his will. You give the commandment for the disease to come. You call for there to be no rain in your hands. That's what reigning with Christ means, with a rod of iron during that thousand years. As I have also received from my Father... And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the assemblies. Wow. Chapter 3. And to the messenger of the congregation in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says these things. What are the seven stars? He told us in the last chapter. The seven pastors, the messengers here. I know your deeds, that you have a reputation that you are living, but you are dead. My. God save us from living on a reputation. Wake up. Strengthen the things that are left that are about to die, for I have not found your deeds perfect before my God. Remember then how you received. Remember how you humbled yourself. Remember how you sought God. Remember how you followed His commandments and stayed close to Him and looked for Him and prayed. Remember how you received and learned and obey and repent. Do it again. Do your first works over. If you do not wake up, I will come as a thief and you will not even suspect the hour I will come upon you. But you have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. There's another example of a pastor not doing his job. A dead man and some sheep still living, doing well, alive in the Spirit. You have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will be arrayed like that in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, but will confess his name before my Father and his angels. Well, what if he doesn't overcome? He will erase his name from the book of life doesn't sound as if you can live any old way that the world wants you to and live forever with Jesus. You've got to overcome this world and your own flesh and everything else It's not God. And then He won't erase your name from the Lamb's book of life. But we'll confess His name before my Father and His angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the assemblies. And to the messenger of the congregation in Philadelphia write, he who is holy, he who is true, he who holds the key of David, he who opens and no one will close and closes and no one opens, says these things, I know your works. This is the other man that Jesus doesn't tell to repent. I know your works. Because your strength is small, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name, Know that I have set before you an open door that no one can shut. Know too that I will make them to be of the synagogue of Satan who call themselves Jews and are not but are lying. 
Now this man obviously hasn't had the power or the knowledge to expose them as being liars the way the minister or the servant of God in Ephesus had done. He's just kind of overawed by them. It's too strong a battle for him. But Jesus still loves him and doesn't criticize him. And he tells him, I'm going to take up for you. And I'm going to turn them over to Satan who claim to be Jews and they're not. Now this man knew they weren't. He wasn't confused by them, but he didn't have the equipment or the strength to do the warfare to expose them. But Jesus says, I'm going to do it for you. I will make them to be of the synagogue of Satan who call themselves Jews and are not, but are lying. More than this, I will make them to come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I have loved you. Glory to God. Since you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation that is about to come upon the entire world to try them who dwell on the earth. I come quickly. Hold on to what you have so that no one may take your crown. Isn't that wonderful? Just hold on to what you've got. I'll take care of the rest of it. Praise God. He doesn't require too much of anybody in here. He who overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never again depart from it, and I will write upon him the name of my God. He's going to tattoo you. <laughs> the, the name of my God's city, the new Jerusalem that descends out of heaven from my God, and my new name. Glory to God. Nobody's going to be confused when he gets through with you as to who you belong to <laughs> or where, you, where, where your home address is. Yeah. You get lost, they'll deliver you back. <laughs> he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the assemblies. And to the messenger of the congregation in Laodicea write, The Amen, the true and faithful witness, the beginning of the creation of God says these things. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, I prefer that you be either cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am about to vomit you out of my mouth. In other words, you make me sick. Man, that's scary, Stuart. Because you say I am rich and full and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are the one who is wretched and pathetic and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to purchase from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may be clothed and the shame of your nakedness not be exposed and I salve to rub on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I hold dear, I reprove and discipline. Be zealous therefore and repent. Pay attention. I have been standing at the door knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will enter in to him and will dine with him and he with me. How about that? He's talking to God's people. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will enter in to him and dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes will I permit to sit with me on my throne just as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the assemblies. Now I have a summary. Revelation class notes, the last two pages, two or three pages I believe, are a summary of chapters 2 and 3. Verse 9 of chapter 4. What does it say? Chapter 3. Right up here that the assemblies that are calling themselves Holy Ghost filled people that they are not. Well, the, if you call yourself people of God, you're saying you're Holy Ghost filled people. Are you saying that he's called Synagogue of Satan. There's some other spirit in there other than God's spirit. That's how Jesus sees it. He's called people who claim that they know God, but they don't. Worshippers of Satan. You know, most, most people think these guys in the black coats and meet out in the woods and sacrifice babies, cut up babies, or do whatever, they're worshippers of Satan. Satan is disgusted with those rascals. He wouldn't have them. They're not Satan worshipers. They're worshiping some kind of goony thing in their own mind. 
That's not Satan worship. That's kind of stuff that makes him sick. He wouldn't have it. He wants something that's dignified, orderly, and respectable among men. And that's religion without the Holy Ghost. With the beautiful robes and the beautiful buildings and the whatever. Beautiful. Without the Holy Ghost, that's where you're going to find the real Satan. That other is just a decoy so that his ministers can rail about how bad they are. Have something to point to to get your attention off where Satan really is. Chapter 2? The morning star. The morning. What is the morning star? I don't know. I know G Jesus is called the morning star. I will give him the morning star. I was like, I will give him myself. I don't know. My father said this, and it stuck in my mind. It's so true. God is looking for people from among those with the Holy Ghost to worship Him in spirit and in truth more than He's looking for sinners to get right with Him. He's looking for His own people to worship Him the way He wants, them, wants to be worshipped. More than anything else, He wants us to be right. He wants us to do it right. He wants to get His own house in order. And others are welcome. Sinners are all welcome. Those of you know Satan worshipers, they're welcome. Jesus will take them in. Satan won't have them, but Jesus will take them in. They repent. That's who Jesus came to when came. They're sick. They need a physician. Jesus said, the world will know that you're my disciples by the love you have one to another. And he prayed for us to be one for a couple of reasons. Number one, so that the world would know that God sent Jesus. When, when God's people are divided the way they are, the world doesn't really take it seriously. And number two, so that the world would believe that God loved Jesus. Jesus said both those things in John 17. He prayed for us, all who believe in Him, to be made one so the world would believe. And Satan has come up with clever ways. The religion of Christianity, one of them, the biggest one of them, to divide God's people. To persuade some to join this, some to join that, to keep them divided. It keeps everybody confused. keeps the whole world deceived. They all claim to be serving Jesus. All claim to be serving Jesus and they're all doing something different. And if it's not in the spirit and the truth, it's all wrong. These are messages to real people that were alive at John's time. Real situations. And we've got our own that we need help from Jesus with. Yes. And if he doesn't help us, we're going to end up hurting somebody, Billy. Yes. We can't help it. That's all we've got. In us, all we can do is hurt people. And in the Lord, all we can do is help them. And that's what we want to do. We want to help people instead of hurting them. We don't want to be a stumbling block. We want to be a stepping stone. Go up higher. Glory to God. Let's pray tonight before we leave. And Jesus will stay with us and help us deal with things.